I'd like to welcome you to my new YouTube channel. This is The Educated Grunt. Uh, in this channel, we'll be discussing military history, a little gaming, maybe some reselling on Amazon and eBay. I know it's a weird combination, uh, but that's kind of the stuff that I'm into, and hopefully I'll find a few people that are into that stuff too. Uh, I'm going to be doing a video series on uh, the eastern flank of the Chosin Reservoir in Korea in 1950. Uh, it's kind of a forgotten uh, history of the U.S. Army's involvement there. I'd kind of like to start this video this series by dedicating it to uh, all the men who served at the Chosin Reservoir, both Army and Marines and sailors and the airmen. In uh, late this November, early December 1950. Like I said, I'll be focusing this series of videos on basically the forgotten soldiers who fought on the eastern flank of the Chosen Reservoir, namely the 32nd and 31st Infantry Regiments, respectively. Those two units were formed into task forces named after their commanders, Task Force Faith and Task Force McLean. I'd also like to take a, a, a moment, to, a little personal time, to remember my father who served in the Service Company 32nd Infantry Regiment of the 7th Infantry Division. He was captured in uh, December 1950. Thankfully, he survived uh, the battle in the POW camps, or else I wouldn't be here and making this video for you. But he paid a terrible price for that, for his service, uh, both physically and mentally. Uh, to the men of Task Force Faith and McLean, May your valor and sacrifices never be forgotten. The Korean War is kind of strange. It's it's basically called the Forgotten War. And uh, I believe if you were to ask the average American to name them, uh, some of our most traumatic wars in the 20th century, most wouldn't even mention Korea. I think there are a few reasons for this. The first reason is that the Korean War was rel relatively short. The war began on... Uh, June 25th, 1950, when the North Koreans invaded South Korea by crossing the 38th parallel. The fighting ceased on the 27th of July, 1953, when the Armistice Agreement was signed at Panmunjom. Most active warfare was pretty much finished by May of 1951. However, after that, the war essentially became a stalemate in similar to World War I trench warfare in some respects. Stalemate doesn't generate a lot of newspaper headlines. And it doesn't really give you a lot of uh, exciting newsreel footage. The Korean War wasn't even called a war at the time, sadly. At a news conference on June 29, 1950, President Harry Truman labeled it as a police action. As it was an undeclared military action conducted under the auspices of the United Nations. To me, this means that the polit uh, politicians who want wanted to be politically correct... There are people uh, who are worthy of suspicion then as they are now, you know. Uh, they considered the North Korean uh, invasion of South Korea not to be an act of war, which it clearly was, was a hostile invasion. But it, was to, it seemed they wanted to make it seem like it was some criminal act regarding a police action. Sadly, this diminishes the value, the service, and valor of the veterans who served there. War is ex existential. Police action is administrative. The Department of Veterans Affairs still does not call it a war to qualify for certain veterans' benefits. One must have served during a period of wartime as defined by federal law. World War I, World War II, and the Gulf War are such wartime periods. But the Korean War, while it was considered to be wartime, is referred to as the Korean Conflict. Also, the Vietnam War is referred to as the Vietnam Era. Second, the Korean War closely followed the Second World War. It started just under five years after the victory in Japan Day, or VJ Day. A significant uh, number of American uh, servicemen who had fought in Korea were also World War II veterans. The tactics and equipment were largely the same as the ones used in World War II. And in many ways, the Korean War seemed a bit, seemed a bit old-fashioned. In contrast, World War II, particularly during the dark days of 1942-43, when the war was in question, we didn't know if we were going to win it or not. It was touch and go for a while there. 
it was a, a true existential threat to much of the free world. As World War II uh, receded further back in time, it's developed almost a mythic reputation. The author Studs Terkel wrote uh, a book called uh, The Good War, which won a Pulitzer Prize. It's kind of ironic if you can call any war good. The title of this book has become sort of a nostalgic touchstone. World War II, the last good war. It's the standard by which all subsequent wars are compared and also found lacking. Additionally, as a good war, the goodness has rubbed off on the soldiers who fought it and the men and women who managed the home front and who worked in the factories and decisively contributed to the war effort. Tom Brokaw also wrote a book uh, about these same people called The Greatest Generation. The good war fought by the greatest generation. How could any war that followed ever measure up? All things being equal, as it turned out, they never have, sadly. The third reason was that uh, less than a decade that they uh, signed the Pan Moon John Armistice, the Americans were fighting and dying, admittedly in small numbers at first, in a country called Vietnam, which is even more obscure at the time than Korea had been. By 1964, the Vietnam War was raging, and the nation was watching it on TV. Television was a new invention in 1950, and not many homes had had them. By 1965, they were all over the place. The latest footage of the wounded and dead American soldiers being carried off to the helicopters and the hideous body count numbers which expressed each day's actions and slaughterhouse statistics were viewed in nearly every home over the dinner table. Not in mine, however. My father didn't allow it. I had a brother that was serving in Vietnam at the time. He wouldn't watch MASH either, which was on about 10 years after the war. The Korean War was almost the opposite. As I mentioned, it was not even presented as a war, but as some sort of monstrous exercise in law enforcement. People on the home front were, were certainly aware of it, but it was not covered in the news the way World War II or Vietnam were, particularly after 1951, when the warfare shifted from invasions and artists' battles to a stalemate along an increasingly immobile line. By 1952 and 53, it become a it become background noise. My father told me that Korean War veterans, himself included, were not greeted as heroes in the same way that the World War II vets had been uh, treated with parades and hometown celebrations. What recognition they got was token and pro forma. They and their service were forgotten as fast as the war had begun. Despite, despite being forgettable, the Korean War was brutal and costly. Approximately 36,500 Americans died there, of whom 33,700 died from combat. Some of the rest died in accidents or froze to death. Merely ne uh, approximately 92,100 Americans were wounded, and 4,800 still are missing in action, most of them up in the Chosin Reservoir re region of North Korea, I might add. This is according to the Department of Defense casualty figures in the Joint POW MIA Accounting Command. The number of killed in action has increased and the MI number has decreased slightly over the years as the bodies are still occasionally found at rare intervals when the North Koreans will let few Westerners look for the bodies. Many of the returning combatants suffered from unrecognizable post-traumatic stress disorder, my father among them. Whereas the World War II veterans were cheered knees back into society and helped in so many ways, they were, after all, heroes. The Korean War veterans were expected to cope to basically sink or swim. They had a lot less of a safety net. The war in itself was murky. First of all, it was never technically ended. The Pan Moon John Armistice was just that. The shooting stopped, more or less. It has never stopped entirely. But no peace agreement was ever signed. A state of war still exists on the Korean Peninsula. The North Koreans in particular make a big issue about this. Consider their well-publicized attempts to make reliable nuclear warheads and ballistic missiles with which to deliver them basically against South Korea and the United States. Even the Vietnam War ended with a peace agreement. And today, relations between the two countries, Vietnam and the United States, are basically normalized, but not so in Korea. 
Secondly, nothing really changed in the Korean Peninsula. The two separate countries are still there, each with essentially the same government they'd had before the war. North Korea was probably the most Stalinistic regime on the planet, besides Russia. The demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, which was agreed upon as part of the armistice negotiations, was not significantly different from the old border along the 38th parallel. A few miles north on one side, a few miles further south on the other. In effect, the Korean War accomplished nothing. The soldiers who fought there, or may have not been really aware of it, but I'm sure they felt it in their bones, you know? They feel haunted by their memories and would have no motivation to preserve those memories. There are many reasons to forget, not so many to remember. On a final thought, most modern Americans' sole reference to the Korean War is the movie MASH. This was made at the tail end of the Vietnam War, and it's uh, kind of a sly anti-war and anti-military theme. Very definitely applied to that war and its time. The subsequent TV series toned down the political rhetoric, but left the humor more intact. It was a humorous war. Neither the movie nor the series gives any real impression what the war meant to the American soldiers at the time and the American public. The initial American defeats, then stalemate, then cessation of hostilities without victory, all with a very high casualty counts and no gain. MASH bears about as much resemblance to this brutal and ultimately purposeless war as Hogan's heroes did to the real POWs held in the Nazi POW camps. That's the movie and the TV series were banned from my house. My father would rage and scream, Korea was not fun. We didn't think, uh, we didn't drink and have a bunch of laughs and chase nurses. A lot of men died and suffered there. If you go to any uh, library or bookstore, you'll find maybe a hundred uh, books on the Korean War. Maybe ten on the Chosin Reservoir. And every one of those is on the heroic United States Marine fighting retreat at Chosin. No mention of the United States Army or the Eastern Flank is in books. Except for one. East of Chosin by uh, Appleman, which is an excellent reference book, I might add. There is very little references in any of the formal training um, in the U.S. Army Historical Studies Group or classes or scholarly works at the Command and General Staff College at uh, Leavenworth or the U.S. Army War College at uh, Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. It could be said that the primary cause of the Korean War was World War II. Japan had occupied Korea since 1910. The occupation continued until Japan's surrender in August of 1945. Before then, during the war, at the Allied conferences at Tehran and Yalta, the Soviet Union had agreed to enter the war against Japan within three months of the German surrender. The Germans surrendered on the 8th of May 1945, and the Soviet Union declared war on Japan on August 9th, 1945. It's kind of a strange coincidence that this, that was the same date that the second atomic bomb was detonated over Nagasaki. The Soviets sensed that the war was over within, uh, basically, you know, or within days of ending, with or without their participation, so they invaded and began to occupy North Korea. They wanted their piece of the prize. On the terms decided at these conferences, Yalta and Tehran, Korea was to be divided into the Soviet and American occupation zones. The proposed border between the zones was the 38th parallel. This kept Seoul in the American zone, but there was some doubt that the Soviets would honor it. They had already had Red Army troops rapidly moving south into Korea. It would be several weeks before the Americans could get any troops there at all. Nevertheless, Stalin stayed within the agreement and halted the troops at the 38th parallel on August 16th. Three weeks later, American troops had met them there. South Korea, or the uh, Republic of Korea, or I'll, I'll refer to them as the ROC, and the North Korea, Democratic Pe People's Republic of Korea, or as I'll refer to them, the DPRK, both came into existence as independent countries in 1948. The border between the two countries remained the 38th parallel. Both governments claimed to be the legitimate government for all of Korea, and neither one accepted the border as permanent. 
nor the existence of either government as legitimate. The Soviet Union uh, withdrew its troops from North Korea in 1948. The United States had done the same from South Korea in 1949. At the outset of the war, the only military presence, presence in South Korea was the U.S. Military Korean Military Assistance Group, or KMAG, who was made up of about 500 soldiers who was to train ROK troops as advisors. Doesn't that sound familiar? Throughout uh, 1949 and early 1950, the Soviet Union and to a lesser extent the People's Republic of China both participated in arming Korea. The Soviets first furnished tanks, artillery, and aircraft and provided very rigorous training. The tanks were T-34s, the same as those that drove the best German panzers back 1,700 miles from Stalingrad to Berlin and destroyed most of them in the process from 1943 to 1945. The Russian trainers were combat veterans who drove the tanks and fought with those tanks against the Nazis and the men who commanded them. During the Chinese Civil War, which ended in 1949 with a communist victory, the North Korean army units also fought on the communist side. They became seasoned combat veterans themselves in the process. After the Civil War ended, these units returned to North Korea and became the backbone of the North Korean army. By 1950, North Korea was militarily far superior to South Korea, both in training and equipment. All the ROK Army had were a few small arms. They had no heavy weapons such as tanks and very few aircraft. On the 25th of June 1950, the North Korean Army crossed the 30th parallel, initiating the Korean War, taking Seoul and pushing all the way to the Pusan perimeter. The 32nd and 31st Infantry Regiments immediately get, began preparation for deployment from Japan with the 7th Infantry Division. Intensive training for a proposed landing in Korea focused the training for the 32nd to, uh, to, to learn amphibious tactics. A major problem facing the men of the 32nd at the time was the integration of several hundred ROK soldiers or ROK soldiers who were to fight alongside the American troops. Demonstrations, sign language, and a smattering of Japanese and Pidgin English were used to, during the intensive military training. Thus, the ROC soldiers were integrated at the squad level and introduced the American buddy team system in combat. American soldiers were responsible for the training and integration of the ROC troops. After six days of loading supplies and equipment, the 32nd boarded troop ships departing for the Inchon invasion. The 32nd went ashore on 16 September 1950, and they were immediately met by small arms, mortar, and tank fire from the communist forces. The 32nd advanced north toward the Han River, the last natural barrier to Seoul. The buccaneers of the 32nd, in the cold morning hours of 25 September, crossed the Han River under intense enemy fire and captured their first objective, a dominating hill outside of Seoul at 10.30. Its capture provided the 32nd with, su with a sufficient momentum to gain all of their assigned objectives. With the capture of these surrounding heights overlooking the dominating uh, capital city, the U.S. Uh, Marine elements were able to resume their advance. The regiment was awarded the Navy Unit Commendation for their actions in relieving pressure on the Marines. The division was relieved of all responsibility for the Seoul area on 30 September 1950 and they were moved 300 miles overland, arriving in, P in Pusan to begin training for an another proposed landing, this time at Wonsan, North Korea. Departing from Pusan Harbor on 28 October, the mission of the 7th Infantry Division was changed to land at Iwan and advance to the uh, Korean-Manchurian border. Landing on at uh, Iwan on the 29th of October, the regiment quickly moved northward and split the 1st Battalion on the east coast of the Chosun Reservoir and the 2nd and 3rd uh, Battalions were to go to the Fusan Reservoir area. This concludes uh, my first episode. Uh, if you'd be so kind is to subscribe, like, share, and also uh, leave any comments or questions you might have and I'll be sure to get back to you. Thank you for your time and listening.